All right, guys. Um, so I've been really busy the last couple days. I'm going to make an announcement tomorrow. Once you know what's going on, for obvious reasons, that's been like taking up a lot of my time the last couple days. Um, but I'm definitely, you know, been having a really great month on Patreon. I want to keep that momentum going. This particular video series, Boston, will be on YouTube eventually. So please like, comment, subscribe. Check out patreon.com slash Ryan Leone if you like the content that I put on YouTube. Um, Patreon is an extended version of that. There's exclusive storylines. Like this one was never supposed to go on YouTube, but I wanted, I, I really like this one. So I wanted to release it um, because I want to keep the content consistent on YouTube. And I think it's a good example of what I got going. This one's better than um, the other ones I've been doing, in my opinion. Uh, there's also photos, videos, cuts from my documentary. And for a hundred bucks, you can see my dick, which if uh, it wasn't me, I'd be like, oh, that's totally worth it. Um, but there's different tiers, $3 tier, $10 tier, $20 tier, $100 tier. And I'm going to start rotating the content. So, you know, it's going to go down in tiers and then it's going to come out, um, onto YouTube. So that way, um, you know, my YouTube channel plus my Patreon has the kind of consistency that I had in the beginning of the channel. Um, and thank you so much for everybody that has stuck it out with me. I know I went into like a rough patch for a couple months and I'm just getting back on my feet. So thank you for all your patience. I'm a bitch. All right. So this particular um, series, where we're at with it, I had gone out to Worcester, Massachusetts to um, take that internship program. Got into Ivy Heroin out there and I met my first like real girlfriend, Kate. You know, I had a girlfriend in high school. I've had other girls that... You know, but it like wasn't real relationships. It was like, hey, you want to go see a movie? Maybe we'll finger fuck. Okay. Oh, fuck. I got to be home by 10. All right. Yeah, yeah, me too. Well, that makes it sound a lot more innocent than it was. I was a date at a Coke dealer and her dad was a hell's angel. And he used to pretty much exploit me and make me deliver quarter kilos of cocaine because I was under 18. And if I got caught, I wasn't going to go to prison for as long as him or his cronies would. So, I mean, it wasn't as innocent as I make it out to be, but this particular relationship with Kate was my first like real, like balls to the wall, you know, rip your shirt open and sing into the raining moonlight kind of relationship. And it made me psycho. I was fucking crazy. I was insecure, jealous, emotionally abusive. And I used to not shave my pubic hair back then. So I was just some like emotionally abusive asshole with this little dick and like a big ass bush. It was pretty corny. I'm surprised she stayed with me as long as she did. Um, but we had, we had been out in Worcester and, you know, we both got kicked out of that program. And then my dad, we were homeless for like a week, but it felt like a year because we were, it was like snowing and we had sex in front of strangers just for shelter. It was like taking our soul off. Like, just giving it to them, and then we we're, like, shivering. We're like, fuck, it's freezing out here without a soul. Anyway, stupid. Um, and then my dad had gotten us a trip out to Santa Barbara, and we basically decided to stay. I mean, it was, like, strategic on our part. My dad got us a trip out to Santa Barbara, my hometown. I told Kate, I was like, look, when we get out there... You know, when it's time for us to get back on the plane to go back to Massachusetts, we'll just stay. We'll couch surf. It'll be amazing. You know, people will love to facilitate us just being mooches and, you know, couch surfing. And in my mind, I really thought that I was going to be able to sustain that. So at first, we were living with one of my friends. We'll call him Matt. And Matt, um, you know, he uh, he was really bad on coke himself. Stayed with him for a while. Um, we had kicked heroin when we came out because I couldn't get it. That was the, the only reason we didn't keep doing it out in Santa Barbara right when we got back is because I couldn't find it anywhere. You know, I'd started smoking black tar heroin in high school. And then um, after I went to Massachusetts and started injecting China White, I assumed that it would be easy to get once I came back. But it wasn't. So we were forced to kick. And then we just started doing cocaine very heavily. Stayed with my friend Matt for a while. And then we, we ended up moving in with this girl, Lucy. Lucy had a deaf stepdad. I don't know why. Well, I don't know. I guess it is important. So he had like no idea like what was going on in his house. Basically that house was 
where everybody just went and partied into drugs. Lucy was probably like 16, 17 at the time. Kate and I were 18. And then there was this Coke dealer named Brandon that was having sex with Lucy's mom. He was the kind of guy that like wore race car driver outfits, but he didn't like race a race car. He just had like a leather jacket with like red racing stripes. And he'd like, you know, like hold like a helmet. I'm like, what f what's up with that? Like, Shut up. And he'd just like make us do coke all the time. I mean, he didn't make us, but you know what I mean? He was kind of like a fixture um, in that house. He was because he was boning Lucy's mom and he was kind of just feeding us all cocaine. He was a straight dirtbag. He, he had like bought, a, he had like saved up his drug dealing money um, when he was in high school and he bought a mobile home and he'd be like, yeah, I have $3,200 in equity in my mobile home. And we like didn't even know what equity meant, but we're like, yeah, that's impressive. He's like, yeah, I think I'm going to start racing again next year. But he never did that. All right. Anyway, so where we had left off last time, um, you know, I had, it was raining outside and I was driving Lucy's mom's car and I was kind of like, you know, we were fight. Kate and I were fighting and I start. I like pump faked. And I was like, I'll kill us right now. And like, I aimed the car like, you know, I like try to swerve it just to scare her. And like, we almost died. We almost like got in a car accident. Like we would have like rolled down this big mountain hill to like our fiery death. And she ended up like jumping out of the car and she waved her, you know, just like for emphasis, make it look just extra absurd. And she was like running like this, like in the rain and she went back up to that house. So this guy, Brandon, the Coke dealer, he was always trying to fuck my girlfriend. You know, we talked about that in the last video. And so what he had told Lucy's mom is that I stole a couple ounces from Coke from him, which I never did. To this day, like, you know, I'd admit it. It's been, it's been 18 years. That guy still thinks that I did that to this day. And, or, I mean, at least that's what he would tell people. And it, it, I think that the reason that he came up with that whole thing that I stole Coke from him, because I don't think there was any missing Coke. I think that it was like his, a systematic attempt to get me out of the picture because he, he really like was into my girlfriend, at the, you know, at, for some reason. And he just wanted me to get away from there. So after the whole thing happened where she had jumped out of the car and gone back up to the house. And when I called there, you know, they had told me that, I wasn't allowed to come back because, you know, Brandon wanted to beat me up because they thought that I had stolen Coke from him. And they basically said that Kate was going to be able to live there and that I wasn't. Now, this is the thing. Lucy's mom was bulimic, you know, and she was like one of those like old school bulimic women that had been struggling with it for years and years and years. I didn't understand eating disorders back in that time. Um, and it's a sad thing and it's a horrible thing. And I've watched a lot of women, um, struggle with it, you know, as I've gotten older, what happens when you're bulimic? Um, well, you know, obviously you make yourself throw up, you know, you do the purging thing or whatever after you eat and then you make yourself throw up. And in theory, you know, you can regulate your weight that way. Um, but what happens is the complete opposite. It starts making you puffy and it like kind of like makes you look cause you get like really thin and then you have this big influx of like carbohydrates and it like puffs you out. I don't know if that's the exact science, but Lucy's mom had been bulimic for like 30 years. And what happens when you make yourself puke over and over and over again like that is the, you know, the acidic bile of vomit starts, it's very corrosive on your teeth. So you'll like start missing your teeth. Your teeth will start falling out. And then you like, so you look really puffy and you have like no teeth. So it's like the complete opposite. It's like kind of ironic because it's the opposite of why people do it in the first place. It's a vanity thing. You know, people get self-conscious um, and get like obsessive about their weight, their image. And then they try to make themselves puke to stay thin. They end up getting very puffy and missing teeth. Why did I go into explaining all this? I have no idea. But the point is, is Lucy's mom was bulimic. And very quickly after we'd moved in with them, you know, she and Kate started bonding over bulimia. They'd like have like these like 
epic bulimic conversations, maybe like trading techniques and shit. I didn't know that there was that much to it, but I mean, I, I guess there was. So they had like formed this bond over that. It always, I always kind of got the impression that they liked her, didn't like me. And I think this guy, Brandon, had a lot to do with it. I think he was like trying to influence them into not liking me. You know, like, hey, did you know he was a bitch? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I've heard that from a few people. Oh, can't have that at this house. So when that whole incident happened where I basically like was trying to freak her out and like, you know, crash the car or whatever, and I came close to it, it was just like the perfect, you know, um, confluence of reasons for me not to be able to be there anymore. Brandon didn't like me. Lucy's mom didn't like me because, you know, basically Kate would tell her what an emu emotionally abusive piece of shit I was. And that was like the straw that broke the camel's back. That was like it, like, oh, you can't come back. So they basically like stole my girlfriend from me. And I walked up to the house and, you know, I walked around and I was at this pool area and I was looking, you know, down. Like I was sitting up by these like pool chairs and I could look down into the house and this house was big. It was like a mansion. It was up in the hills in Santa Barbara. The top of the house is where the parents live, the deaf dad who would play Minecraft all day. Uh, he'd like fart and wouldn't know that he farted because he couldn't hear anything. And he'd just be like, you know, playing his computer game and you hear, you know, it would be like those old creaky farts that, you know, like sometimes. Like, Normally, like, you know, people can hear that they fart and it's like a way for them to like assess it or whatever, you know, like if you like try to like sneak one out and it starts to like make that little noise, you kind of can stop. This guy didn't have that ability. And I'm not joking. This would happen like all the time. Like we just like we'd be upstairs and he wouldn't know that we're there because he couldn't hear it. And we just see him in the corner playing the video or the computer game and like he'd be farting all the time. It's really weird. They were at the top part of the house and the kids, Lucy, her little sister, Kate and I, that's where we lived. Brandon, the guy that was fucking Lucy's mom, we'd all kind of hang out in this lower part of the house. Now, for, it was raining that day or that night, um, you know, and I had like this really like ugly goatee. I never was one of those guys that could grow like Johnny Depp goatees or like cologne commercial guys where like it's all like, you know, groomed or maybe I could, but I'm just way too lazy to do that. So I had like that ugly, like it almost looked like pubic hair, just like, and it looked like it was like taped to my chin. It didn't even look real. So I had one of those at the time. I had long hair and I was just covered with acne. I was hideous back then. So just imagine that, ver and I, and I like just try to cut my wrist with like these sharpened rocks. So it's like sitting there, I had all these like little like cuts on me and I'm up at this lounge chair looking down at the house and it's dark, they're not home. You know, usually the bottom part, uh, part of the house was lit up and I could see everything that was going down, going on there from the backyard. Cause sometimes we'd go up there and smoke weed and like we could look back at the house and we could see everything that was going on. But I was up at the lounge chair and I was looking down and it was all, it was all dark. Nobody was home. It was freezing. I remember just like shivering up there and I was like all like, you know, when you're insecure and when you don't have a lot of self-worth, you get really delusional. Like, you know, you always think that your partner's cheating on you. It's very common. This is a very common codependent toxic shit that drug addicts have. And I remember I was just like sitting there stewing, like as like the rain just kind of like, you know, dripped down my face. Probably hours went down. And finally, like the lights come on and I see them. It was obvious that they had left and gotten like takeout food. I think it was like Chinese or something. And I see this guy, Brandon, he has like his arm around my girl. I'm like, damn, dude, I've been gone for like a few hours. And like, I've already been replaced by the race car, the race car driver coke dealer guy and so i didn't know what to do because truth be told this guy was a lot older than you know he's like three or four years older than me but like at that time when you're 18 that seems like somebody's like a lot older than you he was a lot bigger he was crazier 
he was the kind of guy where it didn't matter how mad I was, this guy had the ability to fuck me up. So, you know, I was kind of like, I couldn't be confrontational with him, is what I'm trying to say. So I, I remember sitting up at this lounge chair and I was just watching what was going on in this house. Like I said, he had his arm around her and it was making me so furious at that time. Finally, he got up and he went somewhere with Lucy's mom. And I like just watching from up at this pool area, like obviously I couldn't hear what was going on, but I was just watching what they were doing. And they were like snorting coke off like a CD case. And then eventually he broke off and he went with Lucy's mom. So now Kate was just alone sitting on this couch watching TV. So I like snuck down and, uh, you know, I tapped on the glass door and I was like, I was like, Hey, Kate. and she looked at me and her eyes were all big. She opened her. She's like, what are you doing here? You know, Brandon said that you were lying about killing yourself because if you really did, you'd be dead. I was like, Tch. I was like, come on, we got to go. She's like, why would I go with you? And I couldn't think of anything to say. And like, I don't remember like the pet names that we had back then, but you know, I sweet talked her somehow and got her to leave with me, even though it was raining outside. I forget what I had told her, um, but it doesn't matter. The point is, is we had left that place. So we, we ended up leaving this house and I used her phone to call my friend, Matt, you know, who we had been staying with before that. And I pretty much explained to him that like, because he knew who Brandon was, everybody knew at that point, he was like, you know, just some older drug dealer guy that, you know, everybody my age knew, he was serving everybody. I basically explained to him that, you know, I was in a bad situation in the house that I was staying at. This guy, Brandon, like wanted to beat me up and I couldn't be there. Could he come get me? And he said that he could. And just to walk down this like big mountain road and eventually he was going to come, you know, like he'd be coming up, we'd be walking down and eventually we'd, you know, we'd, we'd, um, we'd intersect. So we were walking down there and Kate's like, did you really try to kill yourself? Or was that just for attention? And like, the only thing I cared about was this guy, Brand. I'm like, did he try to fuck you? She's like, no, he just gave me a blow. I was like, all right. But you know, of course I wasn't buying that. And finally, my friend Matt, like, finds us. We're, we're, like, sopping wet. We've been walking. It's pouring rain. I don't remember how I got her to leave, like I said, but I did somehow. So he picked us up, and he took us back to his place. Now, this signals to Brandon that I definitely stole the Coke. Like, he's convinced of it. You know, why else would I, like, come and, like, you know, steal Kate away or whatever? So we stay with him for, I don't know, probably a week or two something like that. And while we're there, Kate starts feeling sick in the morning, you know, like we're there for like a few days before she starts getting sick. And I remember the first morning she was just like, I just threw up. I was like, don't you do that? Like on purpose all the time? She's like, yeah, but I didn't mean to. And I was like, well, isn't that like a good thing? She's like, that's so insensitive. And she was sick. Now, I didn't put it together. I was 18. I didn't know how that stuff worked. But then she started complaining about her boobs hurting, you know. And, like, nowadays, 2020, when stuff like that happens, when you're, like, having symptoms, when you're, like, nauseous, your boobs hurt. Of course, nowadays, I know that that means you're pregnant. Back then, um, you know, Google wasn't, you, you didn't have smartphones. You couldn't just, like, look stuff up as easily as you could. Um, but I remember Matt had an older sister and she like had overheard that, you know, she was nauseous and that her boobs hurt. And she suggested that maybe Kate was pregnant. Now, we were using birth control back then. We were using one of those things called the, like a Nuva ring. And I believe that you're supposed to wear that. I don't even know if that's the right way to say it. But I think you're supposed to like insert that in your vagina. And I think you're supposed to leave it in there. But we were, like, so young, we thought that, like, you just had to, like, stick it in there once, and you could, like, take it out, and then you were, like, like, oh, I'm birth controlled, and you could just, like, throw it away. So we weren't even using it correctly, and we were having sex all the time. And she started getting really worried, you know, that we were, that, that she might be pregnant. So we ended up going, and Matt bought us a pregnancy test, you know, like, one of those double packs that you get at, like, the pharmacy. 
it's over the counter. It's probably like 20 bucks for two of them. And we were hanging out downtown Santa Barbara at the time. Now, back then they had a bookstore called Borders Bookstore. And it was like a three story, um, big corporate bookstore. I think it was a national chain. In fact, they went out of business. They're not around anymore. Pretty sure Borders was national though, if I remember correctly. But the bathroom for that store was on the lower level. Matt and I were at the cafe, which was on the third level up. So we were at like the very top. And right after we bought it, she's like, okay, I have to pee. And she ended up going down, you know, to the bottom level. We were all the way at the top. And we were just like sitting there getting a coffee. And I could hear her screaming. She's like, ah! Like it like reverberated through the entire store. Like people are looking. It was crazy. It sounded like she was getting murdered or something. And I looked at him and I was like, fuck, she's pregnant. I knew it. I knew right there and then that she was. And, um, you know, we like went racing downstairs and we, we found her. And she was just like, she's like rubbing her face. She's like, <gasps> I'm pregnant and like all these people are like looking at her because she had just been screaming like a mad woman in this bathroom and I went and I hugged her see back then I was so crazy I was like one of those psycho ex-girlfriends that like thought that like you know a pregnancy would like bind us together for life you know we'd be like intertwined for eternity so I was like all happy that's how psycho I was back then I was like thinking like oh all right, well, that means that I get to keep her forever. And she was, of course, you know, she was very upset about it. She didn't know what she wanted to do. And, you know, I was like, well, just because you get like a positive test from like one of the over-the-counter things, I think we still have to go to a doctor and verify it, you know? So back then, and I believe that you still can, we set up an appointment with Planned Parenthood to go have her get like a real blood test and figure out what we we're going to do. And we went, um, you know, we didn't have a car at that point. I mean, my parents had my car at their house, but they thought that we were like in Massachusetts at this point, you know, I like once in a while I'd talk to them on the phone and they'd be like, they'd be like, did you get, you know, how's it going? I'm like, God, it's cold, dad. It's snowing. But like, he'd be like checking the weather and it wasn't snowing. So he was getting suspicious that we weren't actually out there. Um, he didn't know that we were, of course he didn't know that we were still in Santa Barbara, but he started, I think, thinking that because we'd say things that didn't add up, you know, the weather thing that might just be like a bad example of that. But there was a couple of times where he started getting suspicious. He even asked me, he's like, Ryan, are you really in Worcester? I was like, yeah, where else would I be? Like Matt would be like saying something in the background, but I'd be like, is that Matt? I'm like, no, 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 no. It's just some guy that sounds like him. So my dad kind of knew. And we went to Planned Parenthood and, um, you know, they confirmed it. They, they did a blood test. So her and I started talking about it and, you know, what we wanted to do. And Kate's like, do you think I should abort it? And I was like, no. No, I started getting like all like righteous and pro-life, you know? I was like, no. I was like, that, that's murder. I'm not cool with that. But of course, like I had these weird psycho ulterior motives where I wanted her to have the baby because in my mind, I, I, that, you know, meant that we were going to be together forever. So eventually, maybe like within a couple days. Now you got to remember, I'm 18 at the time. And when you're 18, everything seems like it's a lot longer of a period than now. Like now I'm like 35 and like, a year seems like a week or two, you know, things just become much more monotonous as you get older. Time goes a lot faster. But back then, you know, a few days, a week, whatever it was, seemed like a lot longer. So my, you know, the way that I measure how much time was going by is, is a little skewed because of the age that I was at that point. But she decided she wanted to keep it. You know, we had like come to that agreement together. So she stopped doing coke. She stopped drinking. She stopped smoking cigarettes. Just like that, you know, and I've seen that with a lot of women that I've known throughout the years, whether it be women that I've gotten pregnant or, you know, friends of mine's girlfriends, you know, there's a lot of women that can, once they decide that they want to have a baby, they're able to like quit all the bad habits. And that's what she did. So we're living with this guy, Matt, 
at that time. And he had started dating, um, he'd start dating a girl. Now that's not his real name. I think I'd already used his real name, but, um, he started dating this girl. Um, I don't know. We don't need to get into that. Let's just say I was living with him at that time and he started dating this other girl. So I continue to get loaded. You know, I continue to do Coke. I continue to drink. I continue to party. And she had kind of just, you know, hung up the towel, so to speak. And I remember getting high in front of her all the time and it became like this source of contention between us. Like we were always fighting about that because she thought that I was being selfish for doing drugs in front of her, which I was definitely looking back. I can admit that because when Karina got pregnant, we were both really bad alcoholics. By that point, I was like 32 and I'd been down this road before and I quit drinking, you know, to show solidarity towards her because she was a really bad alcoholic. And when she made the choice to stop drinking, I decided to do that as well, just to, you know, make it easier for her. But back then I didn't give a fuck. I was like, whatever, you're just going to have my baby. We'll be together, but I'm going to keep it doing me. So one day we end up going to my friend Jesse's house and he was having, he was still living with his parents at that time. He was a couple years older than me and he was having a keg party. This was like 11 in the morning, noon, something like that. He, he had a pony keg. So he had a bunch of like our friends from high school over and everybody was drinking and barbecuing at his place. Matt's girlfriend came with us. And there were some other girls there, including Lucy. Now, we hadn't seen Lucy since that night that we had left her house. And, you know, her mom had been talking to Kate, like, the whole time, seeing if she was okay, because, you know, they all thought that I was a psychopath. I was thinking that that guy, Brandon, might be at this particular barbecue, but I didn't know for sure. And we were just bored. We were getting, like, you know... We are getting like cabin fever just being in Matt's house all the time. So we decided to go to this barbecue. I was hoping that Brandon wasn't going to be there because he still thought that I had stolen those couple ounces from him and I didn't want to get in some sort of confrontation. So we get there and Lucy's there with one of her friends and then Matt's girlfriend's there. And they all kind of like group up. So Kate's with them. I'm drinking, you know, I'm, seeing friends that I grew up with, not really paying attention to what they're doing. Kate ends up going into this bathroom with these other girls. Now, the one thing, they were like all random girls, but the one thing that they all had in common is that they smoke crack. I know that sounds weird, but that was like, that was like their shared hobby or whatever. The common denominator between these women was that they smoke crack cocaine. And I saw her go with them into this bathroom. Now, I'm drunk at this point. You know, I've been drinking, um, you know, beer out of the keg or whatever. Probably had like six or seven beers. And my tolerance for alcohol definitely increased as I got older. But back then, I was still kind of a lightweight when it came to alcohol. Like six, seven beers, eight beers, whatever I had drinking, like got me pretty drunk. And I remember being drunk that day. And when I would get drunk back then, I would get angry. Or I would get more angry than I already was. Because I was an angry 18-year-old. You know, I'd already felt like I'd been through a lot. Getting sent away. Um, you know, all the stuff that had gone on in Worcester. I don't know. I was just, you know, I was one of those people that was like very frustrated at 18. I think a lot of people are. So I go up to the bathroom because I saw Kate go in there. Now, Kate's pregnant. And I definitely didn't want her smoking crack, obviously. I mean, we decided to keep it. So I went and I knocked on the door. I was like, Kate. And I heard like this like scuttering sound. Like, you know how like when you knock on the door and you know somebody's on the other side of it and they're like doing something they're not supposed to be doing. You'll hear like some like a bunch of noise of the person like trying to cover it up, whatever it is they're doing. That kind of thing had happened. And like one of the girls like sticks her head out. Now her eyes are all big. She's cracked out. I can smell crack. Crack is a very distinct smell. She sticks her head out. She's like, yeah. 
looks like the Grinch, you know? All crack kids have that, like, raised eyebrow, like, Grinch look. She's like, yeah? What's up? I asked her straight up. I was like, hey, are you smoking crack with my pregnant girlfriend? She's like, no. Door slammed in my face. Well, this made me mad. I was already drunk. I fucking, you know, kicked the door. I remember kicking, like, the the doorknob or whatever. Now, this is my friend Jesse's house. He still lived with his parents at that time, but they weren't home, you know? And they were the kind of parents where even if they were home, they kind of let people do whatever they want. Jesse's the same guy that from the juvenile delinquency um, series when we had taken Marazine together, right when he started tripping and he was in, in the backseat of my mom's car. He's like, I didn't take any of that fucking vodka, bitch. That guy. So I remember kicking the, you know, the doorknob not even caring that it was his parents' house. I was just drunk and it didn't matter. And finally, like, I kicked it enough time where the door swung open. I broke it. Whole bathroom's foggy with crack smoke. Kate's wearing a hoodie and she's just looking at me. And she's like, what? We're just doing makeup. And I was like, how could you do this to us? You have my child. You have our child inside of you. And I, like, probably started crying because I was a straight bitch back then still am and she's just like and so i started like you know my style back then and for years to come after that was if i felt hurt by a woman i would like emotionally berate her or abuse her like to get her back it's like you hurt me i'm gonna hurt you back even worse it was just like a weird defense mechanism definitely not saying that it's right because it's not and um the way that i treated women <clears throat> up until probably within the last few years, you know, up until this relationship I'm in now, this is the first one where I'm like, oh, it's pretty, it's normal, you know? I mean, comparatively. And so I, I started saying mean stuff to her. And I, I like, I hate the things that I'd say to her. I'd be like, you fat bitch. Next time you stick a finger down your throat, I hope you choke on it and you die. I'd like, I'd like rip a flower out of the ground just like for emphasis and like throw it, bitch. And she's just like, oh, you're being so mean. And like tears were like streaming down. And again, this is in front of these other, you know, crackhead girls that were smoking crack with her in the bathroom. And crackhead girls, like, they get stuck. So they all had like that Grinch look and they're all just like looking at me, like, can't believe the venom that's being spewed out of my mouth. This emotional abuse that I'm waging towards Kate. And finally she's just like, you're an asshole. And she just runs. Runs out of the party for this barbecue. So I start chasing her, you know. And like in my mind, I'm like, I need to stop her from giving my, you know, our fetus crack. So I'm like chasing her out of this barbecue. Now, shows what kind of friends I have. They'll just kind of watch me like, huh. Yeah. Ryan's drunk again. I'm just chasing this pregnant girl like outside of, um, you know, the barbecue and the party and this house. So we end up getting, you know, off of this property. And I'm like chasing her full speed. I'm yelling like obscenities at her. I'm like, you, you know, let me try not to use as bad a language as I normally do because then um, YouTube won't monetize me. But, you know, I'm saying, well, fuck it. I'm saying, you stupid cunt or slut bulimic bitch and I'm like spitting and shit I don't know we were running and she's like she kept looking at me she's like why are you just get away from me I hate you I hate you and I'm running just screaming this stuff at her like my face is probably all red I'm like super drunk I look absolutely psychotic with this little like ugly pubic goatee that I had so I end up we probably get like three or four blocks away from this party and I end up seeing this group of surfer kids, you know, and you guys probably remember this story. There's going to be a little overlap. That's some of these storylines, like, you know, um, it's necessary to overlap stuff that you've already heard before, but there's a greater purpose for it. But I see this group of surfer guys, probably Christian surfer guys, you know, the type. Like, oh, hey, man, trying to go surfing and maybe talk scripture afterwards. They're like, dude, that sounds so rad. Let's do it. And they like meet up and they surf and then they like stand in a prayer circle. And look, I'm not making fun of um, Christians or people that do stuff like that. I'm just saying that's what kind of guys these were. So they see me and they're, I swear to God, they were in a circle 
and they probably were doing like a little like you know prayer circle at that point and one of them sees me he's like whoa brother stop because he sees me chasing her and he puts his hand on me like he like touches my shoulder and i'm like i'm like hey man i was like mind your own business i said don't touch me again he's like hey brother let's just you know why don't we take a second and just take a breather okay he's like saying all these really corny like bodacious surfer <laughs> slang words and shit I, I forget what he was saying but you know i warned him multiple times i said hey man like if you put your hand on me again i'm gonna I'm going to crack you in the face. He's like, what did she do to you, brother? He put his hand on me again. And I just, I, I cocked my fist and I just cracked him as hard as I could in the face. Well, by me hitting him, they ended up calling the cops. So I kept chasing Kate. And I'm chasing her like, I don't know, probably get like another... I probably chased after her for like another five minutes or so. I want to say it was long enough where the cops had been called and, you know, they said that I had assaulted this Christian surfer. That's what the charge was. Assault on a Christian surfer with intent to scripturize or whatever. Um, so finally I catch up with Kate and she's like, like it's at the end of the sidewalk. So she's just stepping off the curb and I go to grab her. I was like, Kate, I just don't want you to give drugs to our kid. And like, I grab her by the back and by me grabbing onto her, I fall on top of her. So she falls down. Like she falls like right onto the street. I didn't mean to do that. I didn't push her. I was just trying to grab her to stop her. Not saying that that's right. Definitely not. Um, but this is what happened. <laughs> so she falls and she's like, oh, get off of me. And she's wearing this hooded sweatshirt. So I go into like the little pouch that's inside of her sweatshirt and I grab a crack pipe. It's like this glass straight shooter tube that has some bunched up Brillo in it. It's a crack pipe. And I was like, I knew it. And she had like a little bit, like a little bit of powder cocaine as well. And as soon as I grab that stuff, I just feel a hand on me. And it just like, it gets tugged behind my back and I get handcuffs put on me. I was like, like, I didn't even see a cop. And what, what had happened is when I hit the surfer guy, like his buddies called the cops. Like I laid him out and they called the cops and said that I had assaulted him and that I was chasing this pregnant girl down the street. I don't know if they knew she was pregnant, but they said I was chasing a woman down the street. <clears throat> now... When the cop finally catches up with me, she had fallen off of this curb and I'm like standing above her like a madman yelling at her and I'm holding a crack pipe in my hand. It looked so bad. I mean, it was bad, but it looked even worse than it was because I wasn't even smoking crack or anything. It was like the only good thing I was doing. <laughs> Never mind the fact that I tackled a pregnant girl. I didn't really tackle her though. Like you got to understand, like I swear on everything that's important to me, I just went to grab her like... I went to grab her sweatshirt and I fell on top of her and she stumbled off the screw. Either way, though, it didn't look good. <clears throat> and the cops, like, you know, there's a bunch of them now. Pull me off of her. And they're like, did he hit you? And she's like, ah, ah. And she's like, not saying anything. And, I, and I'm like, I'm sorry, baby. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to push you like that. They're like, so you're saying you pushed her? I was like, yeah. I'm like breaking. I'm just on some straight simp shit. Breaking down crying. And they end up putting me in the back of the cop car. Now, I did something, which is an interesting phenomenon that a lot of guys that get arrested for this kind of thing do. I start, like, I feel bad for what happened. So I'm telling the cops to arrest me. I'm like, you need to arrest me. I'm an abusive piece of shit. And I deserve prison. I deserve 30, 40 fucking years. No parole. I don't care. I hope that something really bad happens to me. They're like, rape. I fucking deserve it because I'm an abuser. Take me downtown, boys. I'm like talking to them because like at this point, I'd only really seen stuff like that in movies. Now, you got to remember, I also had that warrant for defrauding the innkeeper. I never dealt with that. So I have that as well. So, like, I'm in the back of the cop car, and in my dumb 18-year-old mind, I'm thinking that by telling them this, that it's, like, somehow going to help my cause. 
like all like the things that my dad all the little adages that my dad had always like instilled on me like are coming into my mind it's like all oh, is honesty is the best policy I was like, yeah, I'm addicted to crack. I'm addicted to, you know, I snort powder cocaine. I was just doing heroin out in Massachusetts. Yeah, man, I have a problem. And I, you know, I, I for sure deserve to be in jail right now. I think the streets would be safer without me. Cops are just kind of looking at me like, kind of like bewildered by the whole thing because I'm saying all this stuff that I don't need to be. Now, I also got arrested with cocaine. I also got arrested with a crack pipe. And I also have a warrant for my arrest for defrauding an innkeeper. I was like, come on, boys, take me downtown, take me downtown. I'm crying. And I guess they had asked Kate, you know, they had interviewed her. They said, has he ever abused you before? She said, yes. See, that's a thing. She was talking about emotional abuse. She was, I've never, ever, not one time hit her. The only time we ever got in anything close to a physical confrontation was this right here. It was like me, like tackle, not tackling her. I keep saying that me grabbing her and falling on her like that. And the only reason that I fell on her is because she was stepping off the curb while this was happening. <laughs> but when they asked her if I had ever abused her, she's like, yeah, you have to with me all the time. So I was saying some really, I used to say really bad stuff, you know, really abusive stuff. And I'd find out later, you know, um, after years of being like a piece of shit like this to women that emotional abuse sometimes I think to a lot of people is worse than physical abuse. I mean, physical abuse is a horrible thing. And I have no respect for it, but emotional abuse stays with you forever. You know? Um, I mean, I think both of them do, but what I'm trying to say is that like emotional abuse is, is no better than, than hitting someone. And a lot of women think like, you know, think that it's, it's worse. <laughs> so they end up, they're like, all right, man, well, you're getting your wish. We're taking you off the streets. You're going to jail. And like when the reality of it started kicking in, I started just like sobbing. Like I was so, I was like, I was devastated. I was like, oh. like, you know, I was freaked out. Now I'd already been detained multiple times. Now, another thing is remember I'm out on bail um, out of Massachusetts for with the time that I was breaking into that car. So I'm in like a lot of trouble right now. I just don't realize it. And they end up taking me to Santa Barbara County jail. I remember the whole time, um, that I'm in the back of the squad car, I'm like hitting my head against the window. And they're like, Hey man, can you stop doing that? I was like, I deserve pain. I'm like, just saying all this like really weird emo shit to them. When you get to the Santa Barbara County jail, it's really like kind of scary. It kind of looks like you're like getting into like a castle or something. It's like this big, um, in the opening scene of the documentary uh, or in like one of the opening montages of it, it's for those of you that have seen it on Patreon. Um, there's like this little, with the opening credits, there's actual dash cam footage of when I got arrested for the pimping and pandering thing. And it shows the gate of the jail opening. So like right when you pull up to it, the gate of the jail opens. It's like this bit, it's like I said, it's almost like, it looks like some weird castle thing. It just like opens very slowly. They ended up bringing me into, into Santa Barbara County jail. Now that was the first time that I'd been there. <laughs> Would not be the last. I've been to that jail. I've been arrested in total 17 times in my life. I think that I've probably been to that jail at least 10 or 12. You know, I don't know exactly, but I've been there quite a few times. Um, I know that I've been arrested 17, 17 different times I've been taken to jail. That's not even including the times that like I've been taken to like, you know, holding stations or whatever. So I end up getting um, to Santa Barbara County. And the way that it works is right when you get there, um, they put you in this little like, almost like a waiting room. Um, and that's before they like actually like enter you into the jail. So I'm sitting in this little waiting room, I'm handcuffed and they're like doing all the intake information, like asking me if I have any enemies, all that stuff. This is like a pre-screen before they put you in the drunk tank because they can't like, you know, if you're like some guy that like everybody's trying to kill, they can't put you in the drunk tank, uh, you know, with general population. So they ask me all these like intake questions or whatever. I'm crying the whole time I'm, I'm, and I'm like sobbing. They're like, 
do you want to kill yourself? I'm like, of course I do. You know, saying the things you don't want to tell them when you're doing intake in jail. Or like, are you on drugs right now? I'm like, I'm on like 15 different drugs. They're like, what drugs? Are you? I'm like lying. I'm like, I'm on acid. I've been... I huffed paint thinner this morning. I smoked PC. I'm just telling him all this crazy shit that's not true. I don't know why. I'm just being a J cat. I remember they were like looking at me, like, and one of them was like, hey, look, man. We can't even let you into the jail. Cry. Like, in the condition that you are, you'll, you're, <laughs> they're going to beat you up, man. You, you just, you got to toughen up. You can bail out. Like, it's not that big a deal. I was like, oh, am I going to prison? They're like, probably. I was like, oh. You know, and like everything they were telling me was like, I was like in complete shock. So then they put me in the drunk tank. And I remember like, it was like the first time I'd ever been in a drunk tank. Or I'm 18. And I'm like looking around and there's like all these like hardened criminals. Like guys in like construction outfits with like cut off sleeves. They have, like, toothpicks in their mouth. They all, and, you know, of course, when you get to jail, everybody just, like, kind of mad dogs you. And, like, I'm sitting, I'm just on complete bitch mode. I'm, like, sad dogging them back. Like, they'll, like, look at me with their squinted eyes, and I'm like, it doesn't work. Nobody gives you any sort of compassion. Nobody cared, you know? And I'm, like, sniffling. I'm like, I'm like, do I get a free call? And they're like, the payphone. Like, a couple guys in that drunk tank, I, I know they could tell that it was, like, my first time in there, and, like, not everybody in jail was, like, some cold piece of shit, and, like, a couple guys were, like, asking me, like, what I got arrested for, and, like, I didn't know if what I got arrested for, like, people would want to beat me up or anything, and so I'm, like, stuff, which you don't want to tell people, because now you sound like a sex offender, like, well, what kind of stuff? secret stuff I like kind of just like and so now everybody's kind of looking at me I swear I think they were plotting on me and you know there's a line for the phone of course when you get into a drunk tank like it like now I'm like a seasoned convict like I'll like take my clothes off and like like lay out and like you know like I'm tanning or something I'm all like super comfortable I always snag the toilet paper roll because that's a makeshift pillow the people that have been to jail a million times know that when you get into a drunk tank, your very first priority should be to grab a toilet paper roll because there's only like one or two of them. And the people that have been to jail know that that's what you use as like a pillow. So then I waited in line to use the phone. And, you know, one thing that the cops told me when I got in there, don't call your girlfriend. We're putting a temporary restraining order on, on uh, you're not allowed to talk to her. Like, and if you do talk to her, it's a brand new charge. So do not call her. The phones are all recorded. I was like, I was like oh. you know, I'm like trying to take it all in. So by the time I get to use the phone, of course, the, the person that I want to call is her. So I call her. I'm just like, hello. Are you in a penitentiary? I was like, yeah. I was like, I joined a gang. No, I was being all so I was like, honey, I love you so much. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to I didn't mean for you to fall. All these guys are like looking at me, just like shaking their head. They're like, look at this look at this clown. And I'm like, honey. I'm not allowed to be calling you. They put a restraining order on me to you. So if anybody asks if we talk, just tell them no. You know, the, later I would be charged for this, by the way, because they record all the calls. And I, like, the first time I went to court, I got, like, a new charge put on me for breaking the restraining order. So we talked for a little bit. She's telling me she loves me and that she was just confused and that I was being mean to her. And she didn't know that by telling the cops that I abused her that they meant... Because she's like, she didn't know that, you know, that word to police anyway, means physical abuse. Like, they thought that, like, I was, like, beating her up all the time or that, like, you know, we would get in these, like, physical confrontations and we, you know, as emotional and as, as turbulent and as tumultuous our relationship was, I didn't hit her. She didn't hit me. 
It wasn't that kind of thing. Um, but she told him that I abused him. And that's ultimately why I got charged. Plus, I got a possession of cocaine. I got a possession of paraphernalia. I was in there because I had that warrant. Um, they hadn't even run the, the national warrant stuff yet, you know. But I had that in Massachusetts. So I really, like I said, I didn't realize just quite how fucked I was at that time. So, you know, we talked. I think you get, like, little five-minute calls or whatever. I talked to her, like, a bunch of times. She assured me that she loved me and that, you know, <laughs> we're going to get out of this, babe. You know, but she'd, like, pretty much help me solidify me going there. I would have gone anyway because of the drugs and because I had a warrant. But now I had a felony uh, domestic violence charge, too, which eventually I beat. But that's what I was being – that's what I got charged with initially – um, felony spousal abuse. I was like, Oh my God, you know, it, it sounded really bad. And so after we talked a bunch of times and like I said, she kind of like assured me that it's all good and that she still loved me and that she was still my girlfriend and that it was just a confusing time because she was pregnant. She's like, it's my hormones, you know, whatever it was. I finally like, was like, all right, I got to call my dad. Cause I got to get bailed out of here. You know, this is, you know, I'm like looking around and like all the guys in there just look so angry. I think they all thought I was a sex offender because of what I said. They're like, what are your charges? I was like, stuff. I don't want to talk about it. You know, that's what child molesters said. I didn't know that then. I wish I did because they were all like nobody in there. It was not looking at me. And like I said, there was like maybe like one or two guys that were nice that were kind of like showing me how to use the phone and explaining to me that I was completely screwed. Um, you know, that I probably wasn't going to get out of jail that day. In my mind, of course, though, I'm like, oh, there's no way that I'll stay in here. Because I was used to getting bailed out or having my family get me out of shit. I just really didn't understand the gravity of the situation. So finally, I mustered up you know, the courage to call my dad. Now remember, my dad, although he was suspicious and thought that it was certainly possible that I wasn't, um, you know, in Massachusetts because of like various things that I can't remember now, but like he was already kind of on to me. And I end up calling him. And, you know, when you call somebody from that jail, it goes, you have a prepaid call because you get free calls in the drunk tank from ryan an inmate at santa barbara county jail to accept charges press one you know it's that kind of thing and my dad accepted he goes ryan are you in jail and i was like yeah and i just start breaking down and i'm like telling oh my god fucking spousal abuse and crack crack pipe defrauding an innkeeper i'm like saying this shit like because i had no idea i had no idea how much trouble i was in i just knew that i had like a whole laundry list of charges and that it was possible that i was like you know that this wasn't something that i could just get right out of my bail at that point i believe was fifty thousand. Because they had charged me with a felony spousal abuse. That's a pretty serious charge. That's like one of the few charges where they will give you a really high bail because there's a victim involved. You know, there was that temporary restraining order. And my dad wasn't super mad. I think he was just more concerned that I was calling him from county jail. And him and my mom uh, were down in L.A. They were like an hour and a half down there. At LA and Santa Barbara, like an hour and a half apart. And they were down there for some sort of function. And I had to explain to my dad, like after I explained to him the charges and why I was in jail, I had to explain to him, you know, uh, I had to explain to him like what the situation was with Kate and I, and that she was pregnant. And that the reason that we didn't leave, um, that we, that we hadn't left, or I mean, the reason that we didn't go back to Worcester Massachusetts because we were like homeless out there before we got that apartment that he got us and then I was like we dad we had sex in front of college kids and like the stuff I'm saying I don't think is registering to my dad like I don't think 
you know, this is still the period. This is before I'd gone out to Florida with the Mike Virgin thing. This is before I'd been busted by the feds for a cartel case. This is before I got arrested for being a pimp. Back then, this was all shocking to my dad. Nowadays, I could call my dad and be like, Dad, I've been detained. They're saying that I murdered 36 people. My dad would be like, oh, um, need money on your books? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Send me 100 all right, I'll call you tomorrow. All right, Dad. He'd be like, all right, stay strong. You got this, bro. You know, that's how he is now. But back then, the stuff was still shocking to him. So, you know, I told him that I need to be bailed out. And my dad told me that he wasn't going to bail me out. Said that part of the reason that I continued to get in so much trouble is because he was enabling me. He's like, no, I'm not going to bail you out. He's like, I keep getting you out of trouble and you continuously get in trouble. So obviously me getting you out of trouble is not helping your life. I think you need to go to jail for a little bit and you need to see exactly what your actions can do for you. I was like, <gasps> and he hung up on me. And so right there, it became clear to me that I was actually going to go and do some jail time for the first time as an adult. And we will get into that in the next installment of the Boston series. Like, comment, subscribe. Check out patreon.com slash It was really, 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 really hard for me to do a video. So if this video sucks, if you tell me it does on Patreon, then you'll never see the light of day on YouTube. Palabra.